Hi, it's Maria, and today I'm doing another forgiveness for uh, forgiveness to love video, and um, this is about my life exposed here. And um, today we're going to talk about a homeless fashion show. And does your um, limo have a potty in it? And who drills holes in pipes in cars? And then thieves on the beach. And so, um, you know, I just, I thought about this the other day and I thought, I've mentioned this before, why I wear the same thing, you know, in all my videos that are in this series. And that is so that um, you all know that um, these videos belong in this series. And so you don't have to like um, try to find them some other place. And so, and then I thought, oh, you know, do you remember Mr. Rogers? Well, he always wore that sweater. And so, um, I, I'm not gonna, I promise I'm not gonna wear these in uh, this, in another video, other than the forgiveness to loved ones. But, um, yeah, sometimes it's like almost comforting to, um, to, uh, wear something familiar. You know, I know we all have closets filled. I know I did have closets filled with all kinds of clothes. And yet I ended up really wearing, um, not very few, but I ended up going back to my favorites, you know? And so, uh, not that this is my favorite, but um, I do tend to wear a lot of black. But um, today I changed my bra, actually. <laughs> it's pink. And uh, usually in the past I've had black lace. But um, anyway, um, I just, today I wanted to tell you about um, how my world was unsafe and uh, how, um, how for many of us, we might feel as if our world is unsafe. And uh, to say it's unsafe in so many ways, sometimes for most of us, it can be like a gross understatement, you know? Um, but the reason I'm doing it is because again, the theme of these videos is um, it's Maria Unfiltered. And so here I'm trying to uncover um, and expose things that, you know, have been kind of hidden under the rug for way too long and that so many of us have had to endure. And that's, um, you know, this is the time when things are being purged and things are bubbling up so that we can deal with it rather than a kind of suffer in silence. And so, um, and many of you might be in the midst of this right now. And so, you know, throughout much of my journey, um, you know, it was my family had bought, <laughs> really had bought and harassed and, uh, lied to and blackmailed and bribed <laughs> and threatened, you know, pretty much every potential, uh, friend or neighbor or relative or even acquaintance, you know, who might have considered offering me sanctuary in their home. And, um, uh, it it got to the point where it was so ridiculous that um that actually i mean i thought about it being a conspiracy and yet i couldn't bring myself to actually say that because it sounded too too crazy really and yet the other day someone um i spoke with someone and he was telling me that actually uh he was from chicago <laughs> as well and he said he had suffered something similar to a, a lesser degree, but that in fact, it was like a conspiracy. And so, um, you know, I, I guess the bottom line is I would wonder why, why some of us are targeted. And so um, I, uh, you know, I will reveal that at some point. At this time though, uh, let's just leave it at this. Um, you know, uh, when I talk about why they didn't allow me to have sanctuary, <laughs> and the only reason I needed any sanctuary at all, right, is because in any place other than my own home <laughs> was really because I had no home at all, you know, courtesy of them. And so, um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the lovely thieves in my family, basically my, my sibling and my son. And so we sometimes we go, oh, your sibling and your son. I mean, that's just horrible. You could think like a stranger might want to really hurt you, but your own family, it, it's almost, um, it's shocking, really. And I, I never really imagined it. You know, I guess I was blindsided. I was just so naive. Um, but anyway, 
So getting back to that, getting past that, you know. So I, I sometimes think about um, the times I lived in my car, you know, uh, for almost a year uh, because I had no no place else to live. And so, and, and that car, if it were just a regular car, that wouldn't be so bad. But in fact, it was a tampered Honda Odyssey. And so, you know, it was like daily torture. It was like where... Uh, you know, the gas and the oil and other fluids, you know, were were apparently being siphoned off or were spewing out. Or uh, what I did find out later is there were holes drilled in the pipes so that the fluids would drain. And, uh, and I actually even asked a couple service managers because they said, oh, there's nothing wrong with it. Don't worry, lady, just drive it anyway. And so one guy, he seemed to be really nice. And I said, look, I said, um, you're telling me that there's nothing wrong with this car, right? And he said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's fine. And I said, do you believe in karma? And he looked at me and he started to cry. And I thought, oh, you know, he somehow he was being asked to do something that even he knew was wrong. And he understood that by telling me to drive the car, he was putting me in danger. And so, um, so you wonder what could have that much power? Who could have that much power? Why would anyone have that much power and exercised it to hurt another human being? It, uh, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? And so even when the brake fluids were low and so the brakes would fail or um, the air would be put out of my tires and if I were driving late at night or I, were, I was living in it, right? And so if the car didn't have uh, air in the tires, I would be stranded, right? And so my life was in danger so many times, actually. And so um, you think normal people <laughs> don't want to be responsible for someone's murder, right? And so where, I mean, yes, of course, it was horrible that the lights flashed and the wi the wipers, you know, like wiped they swept crazily and the horns beeped and the alarm sounded and the doors unlocked while I was sleeping and then they'd lock while I'm driving along, you know, and and so there'd be another car that would pass by me and so apparently they had a fob. So they were, you know, locking my car doors and unlocking my car doors and, and turning on the wipers and stuff. And you, you wonder like, wait, um, this isn't a third world country. I mean, we live in the United States of America. And and so what what is this abuse all about? I mean, I, I just didn't have any idea. I just couldn't put the pieces together, right? It was like this big jigsaw puzzle, but I kept missing the key pieces. And so when I'd be driving along, you know, and the trunk would fly open and, and I'd think, oh, <laughs> <laughs> why? Why me, God? You know, and the engines would overheat. And then that was the whole thing because I knew that the car uh, was uh, was uh, ready to explode. And it was being positioned to do that. And uh, the dashboard gauges, you know, would go from top to bottom, so they or right to left, or whichever it was. It was whether they were full or empty, um, you know, or um, hot to cold, <laughs> or whatever. Anyway, the whole thing was just—it was like uh, evil. Anyway, <laughs> and there were a lot of um, a, a myriad of other bizarre malfunctions, and so. Uh, basically it just scared me. It was designed to scare me. And so we'll get into uh, why this would happen and how could all of these places, I mean, and I had taken them to about six different dealerships and, and sent, oh, I think I wrote, I don't know, a 10 page letter or something describing uh, the, all the dealerships I had been to and what they had told me. And, um, and so 
I had taken them to six different dealerships, but you know, apparently it was so well done that had I taken them to another six, I would have still had the same result, right? And they would have said, oh lady, just go ahead and drive it. And uh, you know, just hope that nothing, nothing really bad happens to you. And so I'm thinking, you know, this is sick. This is really sick. Uh, this isn't uh, my sister and uh, my son. I mean, what is the matter with them? Because this is not acceptable. And, uh, and like, who gives these people power? These people are thieves. They stole, you know, they stole my millions of dollars that my parents left me. And so they stole my money and then, then they've paid people to uh, make my life an, a living hell. And uh, they're so well protected, actually, that uh, um, they're still continuing this debacle of, of at least the last, well, my sister was working with my ex during the, our divorce, which was what, in the 1996 to 2001, and I had no idea. And so, yeah, she's had her hands in the pot for a very long time. And uh, my son has too. And so uh, how, can, how can people get away with this stuff? I mean, where, where is justice? And what kind of a, um, a country are we living in where we allow this kind of corruption? And so, excuse me, <laughs> anyway, I just wasn't prepared to deal with this kind of crazy. And I, I re do remember though, that there were journalists that had called me after the defamation trial, when they realized that that was a total setup. And they said, you know, um, you really, you tried to expose it. And there are many women who have, and who have had an iota of what you've experienced and they've caved and they've said, you know what, I'm not gonna open my mouth. I'm, there's no reason for me to, to uh, follow down this path and I'm just going to take care of me and uh, I won't say another word. But somehow there was something, there was a fire burning inside of me and I just knew that um, I wasn't put on this planet to not say anything and I knew that um, I needed to speak up for justice. And so, um, and that's really what, um, I think the whole thing was just to see how far can we push her until she shuts up. And so anyway, I'm, I'm still, now I'm doing these videos, so I still haven't shut up. But, um, you know, this kind of crazy was really, it just threw me for a loop. And, um, I, I still, I can't even believe that people would stoop to such low energy anyway. Um, it's ridiculous. And so, um, you know, especially when, when Honda dealerships would look me straight, the service managers would look me straight in the eye and um, they'd say, as if they were talking to an idiot, you know, and they'd say, you know what, there's nothing wrong with that lady, just keep driving it, you know, it'll be fine. And so, um, you know, I know even when I took it to gas stations and all of a sudden the gas station, like the light would go off and it would say it needed oil. So I'd go to a gas station and they'd say, oh lady, there's not even a drop of oil in it. And then they'd say, I don't understand. It's only, you've only had it for like two months and it's a brand new car. So how did it go through all that oil? And so I kept thinking, I really didn't know. So then I'd take it to a dealership and they'd say, oh yeah, it's plenty of oil. We checked it, you know, so just keep driving it. And I thought, you know, that sounds like, it sounds ridiculous, you know, and, and no one, and people were just lying to me. So I called the Better Business Bureau, you know, after I went to six different dealerships and I called the Business Consumer Alliance, you know, and the, um, what was it? The California New Motor Vehicle Board. And I called the Oregon Department of Justice because I, uh, I leased the car in California and then I moved to Oregon. And so I had it in both states and I would take it to different dealerships and the whole thing was just a joke. Anyway, and then I wrote to both governors and then I started writing to agencies in Washington. And so, you know, when I thought the people that are watching me um, are just laughing, sitting back thinking, oh, this is hilarious. You know, we're just, you know, watching this lady just, um, she's, She's never going to figure out what's going on. But um, 
I thought, how evil is this, really? I mean, it is a conspiracy. And so why would someone try to inflict this much, much torture on anyone? I mean, what is the point of this? Uh, was it to awaken me? Was it to strengthen me? Was it to terrify me? Um, was it to, uh, you know to bury me? Was it to, I, I just didn't know. I mean, surely, you know, obviously there was a lot of ill will and a lot of people who um, wanted to see me suffer, but why? And I don't know how many of you have actually gone through similar things, but I know I'm not alone. And uh, I know that even if it has nothing to do with a car, maybe it has to do with your employment, maybe it has to do with, you know, an, um, an ex or someone who was threatening you and who, you know, uh, the narcissist or the psychopath or whatever, and you just cannot get through to them. And no matter what you do, <laughs> they just keep coming at you. And so what is the lesson, really? Because we're all here to grow and we're all here to not react, but in fact, to respond. And so um, when we get that lesson, then it all goes away. And so, so um, at the same time, I think it's very important to note that we are never given uh, anything just by accident, right? It really is every experience we have is for our growth. And so, um, so we have to look at it from that perspective too, because as we are being tortured, um, we are learning that um, we are not to be gullible as we were before. And yet w there are ways of overcoming it. And even though we may not figure it out the first time or the second time or even the third time, eventually we do stand up for ourselves and we say enough is enough. This is, this is not right. And so um, I know some of you have heard uh, my videos where I talk about, you know, I was an adored little Greek girl um, in, my, in my childhood and I had a fabulous education and four beautiful children and extreme wealth. And, and, uh, and at the same time, along with all of those wonderful, wonderful uh, gifts that uh, were bestowed upon me during my life, you know, I've overcome more sabotage and more health issues that they've thrown my way by sabotaging my health and and more plots and plans, you know, to incapacitate me and, and to destitute me and to render me, you know, without help and without a job and without friends and to make me look like I'm a nut saying, oh yeah, well, uh, I just don't understand, but I was driving and all of a sudden my headlights just go off and cars next to me are going, lady, lady, you know, you're in a black car and it's totally dark. You know, we can't see you, so pull off the road. And I'd pull into a, doubt, a Honda dealership and they'd say, oh, there's nothing wrong with your lights. So I don't know, you know, they're fine. Um, bring it in tomorrow. So I'd bring it in tomorrow and then they'd say, lady, like there's nothing wrong with them. Meanwhile, I guess there was another car that was driving by that had the same, fo had the fob to my car and was turning off the lights. <laughs> I mean, it's just nuts, right? And so the truth is that um, um, we can hear about this stuff and yet, you know, we can sit there and go, oh, that's really horrible. <laughs> At the same time, that's nothing compared to if we're living it, right? Because when we have that experience, that's when we can really understand because we have the feeling, we have the emotion that goes along with it as opposed to being the observer and just kind of hearing about it and saying, oh, that's too bad about that lady. Oh, poor girl. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, uh, whatever challenges are thrown our way, we are uh, asked to be dynamic and buoyant, you know, as we leap over the immense boulders that have been put in our path. And so we can um, access the inner knowing of who we really are 
in the physical and the emotional and the mental and the spiritual um, level of our of our, our soul. And so I, you know, I don't want to water this down and talk about spirituality so much because the the nitty gritty is that you know many of us go through horrible horrible situations, and yet at the same time. We always need to look at it from a higher perspective because uh, nothing really happens to us. Everything happens for us. And so we, we learn from everything, right? And so, um, um, I don't know. I went once at a time, truly, without a shower. I'm embarrassed to tell you that. <laughs> um, or warm food. And in my marital home, I think I had eight bathrooms. And so, um, and I might have only showered in two of those bathrooms. And yet I went nearly a year without a bath, without um, a shower, because I lived in a car. Yeah. And um, without warm food, because I didn't have any way to cook it. And so um, I bathed myself every morning. I sponge bathed myself, really. And so once in a while, I would wash my hair at the beach, you know. And and uh, I used to fly to New York for a haircut and for my uh, hair to be done there and and uh, um, color and stuff because I actually started graying when I was like forty before forty, like my mother. And so um, I think it's hereditary. But anyway, um, you know, and on, quite honestly, I ate a lot of, uh, you know, because you, you can't save things, right? When you're living in a car, you don't have a refrigerator. And uh, at one point, I bought a styrofoam cooler and uh, the ice packs, but I had no way of freezing those ice packs. And, um, and plus, you know, I just didn't have that much room for a cooler. And so I ended up eating a lot of bananas and, and yogurt in the smaller container sizes because you can't keep it, right? And um, I ate a lot of nuts. And uh, I ate a lot of shredded vegetables and hummus. I'd mix them all together and I'd get that at Trader Joe's or whatever. And so I'd have to buy my food daily. And so... Um, you know, and then we think of, remember those commercials where um, it was like Calgon, take me away. And they, uh, Calgon, they had these limos and there was a bathtub in, in the back of it, right? Well, yeah, not a chance. But anyway, my, um, my little limo didn't even have a kitty potty. And so I'd actually um, have to measure. I'd have to keep track of the ounces of water that I drank every day because um, I had to know how often I was going to empty my bladder. I mean, that's really how um, how crazy it gets. And so when you look at a homeless person and you, you look at someone who's traveling or someone who's, you know, going through a really bad time, do you really think about how difficult life is for them? And, and as I thought about it, I thought, gosh, you know, I'm rich. I'm really rich. And I'm like counting how many ounces of water I'm drinking because I need to know where I can go and find the facilities so I can empty my bladder. I mean, I, you know, it's, uh, I, I would get really angry and then I would just say, oh, you know, they want me to get angry. And so I'm just going to just kind of write it out because I know that, um, I am becoming a much more patient person, <laughs> a much more understanding person. And yet, you know, I studied psychology for four years at Northwestern. And so, yeah, I, I um, know a lot about abnormal psychology and I know a lot about uh, mental illness and, and psychiatric disorders. And yet I never imagined that there were so many of them in my own family that then would kind of turn them around and, and I would be the target of their, of their mental illness, which was really bizarre for me to even go that route. Um, and then I think, um, you know, I almost felt like I was a rat you know, in someone's research project. And then I thought, well, maybe that was karma because um, when I was in grad school, I did a lot of research and I did a lot of research projects where I had uh, rats and rattlesnakes and gerbils and, and uh, cadavers and things like that. And so, you know, I actually studied um, using animal models um, for my experiments and human models actually. Um, 
but those were actually, the animals were actually alive, you know, and then I'd have to manipulate them. The cadavers were, they were uh, gifted to science. And so from there, the, um, the angels, I, I saw the angels that had already left the body. And so I was there in order to, um, to dissect them and to really, to see the nervous system and the circulatory system and all the different organ systems and to teach nurses about them and to teach med students about the brain and the spinal cord. So that was different. And yet when I used the animal models, I realized that it was like a research project, you know? And so I thought, oh, I wonder if that's kind of like, was I getting karma for doing that? I don't know. Does every medical researcher get karma for using animal models? Because all of a sudden then we become like the rat in the cage where people are looking at us and doing all kinds of things to see how we react. Anyway, it was it was kind of a really weird thought, actually, you know, um, but um, it was kind of, uh, I didn't realize that there were so, um, that they were implementing such draconian measures, you know, in, in those situations, you know, because all in all, I realized that I could only trust a few. Right. And so many of us have come to that realization, whether or not you have anything to do with any kind of scientific uh, research or not. We realize that in this world, in this time, uh, in the evolution of humanity and of the planet, we really trust few. Right. And so um, and so we uh, we um, we trust few. And we realize that um, that uh, we can only trust ourselves, actually, because we are the answer to everything we need, right? We don't look outside ourselves for anything. It's all inside. We have the answers to every question we could ever come up with, right? And so I realized that when... Um, when my name was being smeared in Chicago and then in Florida by my family who spread all these lies about me, that was really a an interesting time for me because, you know, at the same time, I wanted to stand up and I wanted to say, hey, that's not true. And yet, and yet I couldn't do that. And so I sat back and I just kind of watched how it played out. And I thought, you know, at the right time, people will know the truth. And I think that's true of anyone that, um, you know, might be in the spotlight, even the political figures and the celebrities and stuff, you know, all kinds of horrible things are being spread about them. And most of those things are lies anyway. And it's just to um, sell magazines or it's just to create a story or whatever. And so we need to be very cognizant of how we, um, how we, what we believe and what we accept and um, and how we don't want to play into that because it can then be turned on us. And many times it is. And some of us know it and some of us don't. For years, I never knew the things, the lies that were being spread about me by my own sister who, um, I don't know, she just felt like, you know, by, by, uh, by kind of sabotaging me, she would elevate herself. Anyway, I, I really don't know. It was just a lot of backstabbing drama that I really wanted nothing to do with. And so anyway, um, uh, I had to just be the observer of it. And I urge you to do the same. Don't stoop uh, to their level because uh, we, um, it's just not worth it, you know, because we're, we're better than that. And so it's important to take the moral high ground, in fact, you know. And I, um, I hadn't really witnessed many crimes. But I'll tell you, when I lived in my car, I did. I witnessed more crimes than I could imagine. Let me just get a sip of water. I'm really parched. Excuse me. Thanks. Anyway, I actually saw... When I was parked, in, when I was sitting in my car, parked on the beach, 
um, I actually saw open vehicles that were like dune buggies, you know, and they drive up and down the beach. And um, all of a sudden, there'd be like these hooded men in black and they jump out of these dune buggies and they go to like patios and porches of, um, of homes right on the beach and they carry things out and put it in the dune bugs, dune buggies. Um, and so, and these were like luxury beachfront homes and patios. And so, um, you know, at the same time I was in my car, like parked right there. And so I would crouch down so low and, um, so that no one would see me. And, um, every once in a while, excuse me, I'd get a flash of a thought and I think, Maria, what are you doing here? I mean, this is like so crazy. This was like the twilight zone, but worse. I mean, this is like, um, how could, how could you be doing this? You were crouched like a criminal and you were there and you didn't want anybody to see you because you were like terrified and you didn't know if they had guns or whatever. And so all you could do was just like, shh. And then, um, and then I'll tell you what really would scare me was um, if in fact uh, there was like a dog, because as much as I love dogs and they come to me, I didn't want them to pick up my scent and all of a sudden like stand right outside the car and start barking and then call attention to me because that would really blow my cover. And I was like, oh my God, that would be so horrible. Anyway, um, I'd, I'd have a real tough time with that. And the police would come to pick me up and they'd say, hey, lady, where do you live? And I'd say, um, I used to have a bunch of houses, but right now um, I'm living in my car. Or, um, so who's your next of kin? Well, actually, my um, sister and my son, my parents died and um, my sister took care of that. And my children don't speak to me. And... Um, I have a sister and a son, but they, they prefer to steal my things. And so I don't think they'd really want to get me out of jail. No, I don't think so. And so if they'd say, okay, so who's your one phone call? And I'd say, um, well, I don't know. And then they'd say, well, who's going to put a bail for you? Um, I don't really have anyone. I don't, I don't know anybody. And I think, oh my God, no home, no parents, no kids, no friends, no money for even bail. Oh my God, you know. Um, and I'm sure I was flagged in their system because my, um, I hear my sister called the FBI and said I was um, a, um, what did she say? A security risk, <laughs> like me, a security risk. I think that's actually more funny than anything, um, but um and then I guess they'd, I was probably flagged in their files because how many people owe their ex uh, $30 million at this point? It was $10 million in 2004 or six, but right now it's probably up to $30 million and then it's going to go up to $50 million and then it's going to go up to half a billion by the time I'm 80, <laughs> but um, for a bogus lawsuit. And so uh, I just thought, you know, this planet is really... Um, really bizarre and um we need to really uh well we need to expose this stuff right because so many people are being um tortured like this fortunately i can sit back and kind of just go um okay well i'm going to tell you about it because it's so bizarre and uh you know i don't lose any sleep over it but uh not now but um you know, a lot of people have been pushed to the edge because of the injustice. And so we don't want to make light of it. But at the same time, you know, I'm not going to sit here and um, tell you this horrible, horrible story because um, I don't see it that way anymore. I, um, I, I love my life and um, I, I hope you love your life because every day, I mean, every moment of every day, we are able to partake in the miracles around us. I mean, every blade of grass and every flower and every butterfly and every dog and every kitten and everything we have. I mean, the wonder of, of a cell phone where we can, you know, I used to read the encyclopedia 
Um, but in fact, all we have to do is Google. Any question we have is available. The answer is available on Google. And so we have so many things at our fingertips. And there are so many wonderful people um, who unfortunately have been kind of, because they've heard so many horrible things about me, they just kind of stay away. But then I think, well, you know what? It probably wasn't meant to be anyway. And uh, because the people that are meant to be in our lives will be in our lives and nothing will deter them. And yet the people who've come and gone, you know, they they weren't, they didn't have any staying power in our lives. And, and maybe they were just a quick lesson, you know? And so everything that happens, just um, turn it around and see the beauty in it and see the gift. Um, and so it's almost as if, you know, we, as we go through our different challenges, we have this divine armor on us, you know, and so, um, and so sometimes I wonder, you know, what the hell happened to Maria, you know, and the woman who loved to love, right? And um, who'd been able to handle everything and to overcome every adversity. And eventually, you know, there were just so many typhoons of injustice and that just kept coming and coming and coming. Anyway, um, you know, when we think about um, back to uh, the crimes, you know, and so, um, when I was living in a car, because so many, you know, now people are having issues. And so, and it, this is something that we need to make the police aware of as well, because there were these big streets in Santa Monica and, uh, there were cars parked on, on either side and there were beautiful homes there, you know? And so I saw, groups of like four or five men across and they'd walk across um they would position themselves uh down the street and they would go and they would um open try to open the the car door handles of cars and i don't know i hadn't actually seen them actually open one because they they'd pull on them but uh fortunately they were all locked but if in fact one was open and in fact somebody, if someone was sleeping in it, or in fact there were, there was luggage or purses or things like that, I don't know what they would have done. I assume they, they were looters looting, but, um, at the same time, um, uh, you know, that really, fortunately I didn't know, and I didn't want to know what it is they would do. But, um, fortunately I was in my own personal hideaway and that was actually, that was actually, um, a good thing for me because that was right after, that was just subsequent to the Greyhound assault and battery, which was where, um, where the bus driver pushed the button to close the bus door on my face and my head. And so, um, so I needed, I needed that, that time, you know, I needed that kind of quiet, uh, where I was really isolated. And, uh, you know, I know that, uh, you know, my, my, uh, sibling and my son, I guess they wanted to damage my face and my brain, um, and my looks and my intellect you know, and I, I remembered, and that was kind of despite my dad, and I might have mentioned this before. Sometimes I, I do have the residual of this brain injury, and so sometimes I do forget what I've said in past videos. But um, I know that since I was a little girl, my father, um, you know, encouraged the son he never had, right? Because he always wanted uh, a son as the oldest. And, uh, you know, he was a Mediterranean, he was a Greek, and a Greek man wants a son, right? And so, uh, and so he told me that he wanted me to have the very best medical education money could buy. And so he'd say, Maria, you know, people can take all sorts of things from you, uh, but they can never take what's between your ears. And so, um, as much as, um, you know, you can know that um, 
it's your education will never fail you. And so I do believe that actually that served as some fodder for some very twisted minds who thought, oh, okay, so we can't take, she thinks we can't take what's between her ears. Well, we'll give her a brain injury and we'll just see, you know, how much, if she's a babbling idiot after that or whatever. In any event, um, you know, as we, um, here's a quote for you. Uh, because Aristotle, if we go back to the Greeks, uh, Aristotle noted that um, educating the mind without educating the heart, you know, is no education at all. And so when we think about it, it's not just what's between our ears, it's that is, yes, that's important, of course, and we all want to have high IQs and we all want to be able to solve uh, all kinds of uh, mathematical equations and all sorts of, of, uh, of um, you know, problems and, and uh, learn things and be educated and everything. But really, uh, I think now we are evolving to a time when that's not enough. And it really is all about the heart. And when we have brain and heart coherence, and that's something that um, there's a uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza, and he does, he correlates the, um, the uh, brain and heart coherence as being vitally important in, uh, in healing the body. And so, um, you know, Aristotle and a lot of his other contemporary Hellenic philosophers uh, noticed that too. And, you know, that was what, over 2000 years ago, I think Aristotle lived in 350 BC or something like that. And so anyway, it would behoove us all to go back and uh, really study some of those ancient philosophers because the wisdom that they had then was just through the roof. And so anyway, um, I just thank my God during so much of the craziness that I've experienced. And so um, uh, I think that that's part of it as well is, you know, when you have a connection to the divine, um, to God, to, to the divine source, to the universe, you know, to your creator, uh, to the Christ, to your angels, to your archangels, to your guardian angels. Um, and it was uh, when you have that deep unconditional love exchange with uh, energy that you can't see, energy that is palpable actually, but that is invisible. Uh, can you even imagine? I mean, you need nothing else but that because that's what keeps us strong. That's what motivates us. That's what gets us out of bed in the morning and keeps us going and allows us to overcome any and all adversity. And so I know in, in uh, one or two of my other videos, I've mentioned Viktor Frankl, who was um, an American psychiatrist who uh, was in Auschwitz. And so he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he, um, and he, dis he discovered that uh, what is it that motivates us to move forward? And so when you think about it, we have to have that will. We have to have that connection. We have to have that belief. We have to have that deep knowing. And so uh, that's what empowers us and gives us the strength to continue. And so, um, yeah, we, many of us have seen the torture of the betrayal and, um, but we see it for what it is. You know, at the same time, we know we're being shown it for a reason. And so, although we don't understand what the reason is, we know that at the end, we're gonna come out much stronger for having experienced it and much wiser for having experienced it. I must say that uh, on my journey, I would not have, um, uh, imagined going through this at the same time, I know that had I not gone through it, I would not be the person I am today. As most people, you know, uh, most of you probably have gone through so much. And if you really think about it, you, you understand that it's all of those experiences that we've had that have allowed us to be so much more than we had ever bargained for. And so, um, and so uh, those are the blessings 
of uh, being on on this planet at this very moment in time. And so we've all come a long way. And so um, we're here to move forward, right? And as we move forward, we are here to help others live um, a more cherished life, right? A life of appreciation and a life of gratitude and a life of joy and wonder um, where we let our bodies just tingle you know, at the sight of every miracle and uh, where we really, really see the miracle of every butterfly. And I say that because I've been seeing butterflies like nonstop and I'm just amazed because I remember being a little girl and I'd see monarch butterflies, but now I'm seeing so many that have such beautiful patterns and beautiful colors and they just kind of fly right by me and I'm I'm just awe struck by it. And uh, every ant and every plant and, and um, it's just every person, place and thing. And so, I pray that you open your eyes, you know, and you you bask in the beauty of um, and the wonder of you and everything that surrounds you. And so I think I'm going to end this here. I know it's kind of, uh, it's been like one long run on, huh? But anyway, I thank you for, um, for those of you that are still here. Anyway, um, let's go straight to 37. And um, please know that I'm so proud of you. And I look forward to connecting with you. Um, at the next video. And so I want you to know that I love you and I thank you again. And if you like this, please like, share, and subscribe. And uh, I'll see you soon.